Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, a lot of it is based on uh, the statin data, of course, but statins have other effects. And that's, that's always been the sort of uh, argument. So then people have started to say things like, oh, every time you lower LDL, things improve. And it's like, um, that's completely not true. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, SGLT2s is one class of medications that raises a LDL, right? It raises LDL. And what does it do to heart disease? Oh, it improves yep. it by quite a lot. Yep. And people always forget the whole um, hormone replacement therapy, one of its purported mechanisms to, to, to uh, prevent heart disease, remember, you know, 30 years ago is a big thing, uh, was that it lowered cholesterol, lowered it by like 25, 30%. So they're like, oh, give people, give these postmenopausal women hormone replacement therapy, you lower their cholesterol and you'll prevent heart disease. Of course, then when the real studies came out, like the randomized trials, it was like, oh, it doesn't present heart disease at all. It might raise it and it might raise breast cancer risk, by the way, right? And yeah. all of a sudden you didn't hear anything about the cholesterol effect, right? And it's like, okay, well, there's just so much data that's uh, that's not consistent. Like yeah. even the statin data, the problem with a lot of the statin data is I think the same problem with evidence-based medicine in general, which is that, the uh, the doctors and the researchers have basically sort of prostituted themselves to the drug companies. To do the study, you need money. And the drug company will give you so much money. But at the same time, we know that if a drug company sponsors a study, you're like 10 times more likely mm. to find a positive result. Yeah, you will all... torture the data any way exactly. you can. To, to tell a favorable story. And I'm I'm sympathetic as a as a scientist, I can attest to the frustration that it is to get science paid for. It is a yeah. brutal process. And so I can see the temptation to get into bed with that kind of money. Um, yeah. But it absolutely, I, I think I'm thrilled that you bring that up. It's it's a topic that um, can make us be accused of being conspiracy theorists. But <laughs> but but I think that there's a little bit of naivete involved in that sort of perspective that, you know, money talks and and it goes a long way in science as it does in every aspect of life. Yeah, for sure. Um, getting back to insulin. So, you know, let's talk about insulin and the metabolic syndrome. How does it, like from a mechanistic standpoint, how does it influence the metabolic syndrome, which is not just obesity and mm -hmm. diabetes, because they are clearly linked. And just as an aside, this is the thing that bothers me like crazy. If you ask an endocrinologist or a trainee or some other doctor, you know, you know that people who are obese have more type 2 diabetes. That's again, not for dispute. And you say, why? They'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, well, obesity is a state of hyperinsulinemia. Type 2 diabetes is a state of hyperinsulinemia. Like, do you think that's mm. like, yeah, yeah, maybe there's a common a clue, variable, yeah. you know? And, and so, metabolic syndrome is identified as uh, this sort of cluster mm -hmm. of five uh, things, which includes type 2 diabetes, obesity, abdominal obesity specifically, but yeah. also um, hypertension, hypertension, high triglycerides, uh, low high HDL. Trigger. Yeah, that, that's the five things. Yep. And they all cluster together, right? That's the that's the important finding of metabolic syndrome is that when you have one, you very much more likely have the other. And when you yeah. have multiple, your risk of cardiovascular disease sort of jumps with each, like hugely with each one, right? Now, how does insulin play a role in the metabolic syndrome? Because I think that's mm -hmm. crucial for today's population because metabolic yeah. disease is by far and away the most important thing we know we, we need oh, to yeah. treat. Yeah, in fact, I completely agree. In fact, just to help the listeners appreciate the scope of this, you know, why would guys like Jason and I be spending time talking about it? Um, as a for me as a biomedical scientist, why would I have devoted my whole career to studying insulin resistance? It's because it is the single most common health problem worldwide. And and Jason, you very aptly uh, mentioned Gerald Reven, who we absolutely must give credit to for the metabolic syndrome. It used to be called syndrome X. It also used to be called the insulin resistance syndrome. 
but that's not quite as sexy as calling it the metabolic syndrome. So I appreciate, I can appreciate the justification for the name change, but I also groan because I fear that it somewhat confuses the issue because if you just call it metabolic syndrome, you don't really appreciate that they all have one thing in common, namely chronically elevated insulin and insulin resistance. And those two things always go together. <clears throat> if anyone tries to tell you that there's insulin resistance without hyperinsulinemia, they don't know what they're talking about. Those problems go hand in hand and you really cannot separate them. So with the obesity aspect, in fact, maybe I'll end with that one because um, it's, it's such an interesting effect um, on the fat cells directly. But with hypertension, you you alluded earlier to the in, the evidence with insulin and heart disease. In fact, Gerald Reven identified multiple mechanisms that explained how insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, but I'm kind of repeating myself, cause hypertension, including forcing the kidneys to retain salt and water, which is increasing blood volume too much, which increases pressure. It induces the growth of the, and the narrowing of the blood vessel wall itself as another mechanism. And then maybe just one more that I'll mention is that chronically elevated insulin also activates the sympathetic nervous system. And so that's resulting in even more constriction of the blood vessels and the heart beating harder and faster. In fact, as a little tangent, one of the reasons I feel so strongly about people not snacking on starchy, sugary fruit foods in the evening, yes, it's the insulin bump, but that combined with the hyperglycemia is a powerful stimulant of the sympathetic nervous system. So the person's lying there at midnight wondering why their heart is beating so hard and why their body temperature is so high and they're so uncomfortable. It's not that they're anxious about something. It's that they went to bed hyperglycemic and hyperinsulinemic, and now their sympathetic nervous system is telling them it's not time to rest. It's time to fight or flight when they're trying to rest.